My name is Robert Weisgerber from AX Semantics, uh, and I'm really, really happy to have something which is like for us a little bit of a speciality meetup because we have actually like finance and reporting and business intelligence and all this uh, stuff here, uh, which is most of our customers, I would say 70% or something are e-commerce and websites and, and product descriptions and category stuff and SEO around. But today, this is a little bit of a little bit different, which is, of course, I mean, driven by the idea that we think most stuff can be automated or should. Um, uh, so um, that's why we started doing the UI path plugin uh, a few months ago and which is now available. So that I mean, there's a reason for us being here today. But um, I still think that Automating stuff is something that should be easy and should not uh, require developers and, and people like that. So that's why we have this little bit diverse group here today. So we have Tilo from Parashift. Um, he'll talk about document extraction and what is actually being able without reading documents and, and typing them into uh, into forms. Uh, and we have Jitin. Do I speak that right? Okay. Jitin, Jitin, but it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. From, from Switzerland, uh, we'll talk about UiPath in general and uh, give all the people who just like clicked on the button uh, kind of an introduction. And we have Jan who has actually will show something real life examples uh, from the finance department, I would say. So in a general sense, uh, what they can do with, with automation and content automation and enable actual processes internally. So um, after this session, Airmeet offers a kind of like a digital networking tool where we can actually sit at tables together. So feel free to stay a few seconds around after that to experience that and talk to everyone here. Uh, I'll be here as well. Uh, uh, during the sessions, feel free to use the chat and the questions. Um, we have Lisa, uh, my colleague, listening in as well. She will try to moderate and then give some, uh, if, if we miss something, but otherwise, um, Feel free to use the buttons that are in the tool. I mean, that's what it is for, and we'll see how that works, right? So, um, and I think we start with Tilo. Um, so, go ahead. Good. I'll share my screen, and let's jump right into it. PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, can you hear me? Is that? Yeah, works well. Okay. You can Perfect. see. It. So, I'll... Good. So. Um, Let's quickly start with what we at Parashift are working on. Uh, we, we're creating a cloud platform uh, where the idea is that you can upload any kind of business document and the platform is able to tell what kind of document is it. So is it an invoice? Is it a form? Is it a contract? Um, is it maybe a, 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 a car paper or car document? So like the, the, the most um, common business documents, it, it is able to automatically classify what kind of document it is. And once we know what kind of document is it, um, to take out all the necessary data that your customers usually need to automate their processes. So um, for example, with an invoice, that could be the vendor, the receiver, the, the total amount, the line items, document date, document number, stuff like that. But uh, with, uh, for example, a contract, uh, it could be a, a signature, a contract date, um, yeah, so, uh, or also the, um, uh, cancellation period, stuff like that. So the most important data we, we are able to pick out from a document, structure it and give it back. And why that is important and why you need software like ours or a platform like ours uh, in the context of RPA, um, I will share in this short presentation. So um, what I want to show here is, is a very simple process with a customer who receives some kind of order form. Um, a customer is filling out a form that, that can be online, uh, but could also be uh, maybe come in by email or even uh, by paper. So what you usually have is, is in the first step, you have a human look at the form, type up all the data that's on the form, check if there's a signature present, check if the document is, is is in a good state, stuff like that is usually the first step if you if you work with documents. Next, the human have to has to maybe check if the address on the form is correct. So he goes on Google Maps and checks if this address actually exists. Then he goes into his CRM and he checks is that customer already created. Then he goes into maybe a second system, checks the current price for the product the customer is, is requesting. And finally, he's able to go into his CRM, create an offer and send that offer out to the customer. So 
usually this is a very uh, human focused process with a lot of steps um, and they all get triggered by receiving uh, one document um, in this case an order form but that could also for example be an invoice that comes in needs to be typed up needs to be signed needs to be checked needs to be booked and maybe in a final step needs to be paid so a lot of the times documents start a process inside of a company or at least they they are part of a lot of business processes uh, documents need to be handled and um, as soon as you start working with processes it uh, with with documents it, it's a huge time waste um, uh, because typing up data from documents analyzing documents and, and structuring generally structuring data from documents is, is very time um, uh, time consuming Therefore, it costs a lot and it's also error prone. Uh, no human is perfect. Um, there's studies that show that uh, on a good day, a human is, is usually about 98% correct. So if you have uh, 100, 100 fields that you need to type up from a document, 2% of them are usually wrong. Um, that's just fact. And our goal is to, to leverage uh, this with, with technology, um, replace the human inside of the document processing um, process to, to structure the data from documents fully automatically until we have an I am um, document understanding artificial intelligence. Uh, AI and artificial intelligence are these bad marketing buzzwords. What we are working on is but actually creating a, a machine learning cluster to, to get all the data from documents, get the human out of the loop. And the more we can automate, the less time we need, the less cost you have in your processes, the, as, the less error prone it is, and that all through technology. So back to the, the, the human process. Again, um, if we think about that form, uh, you have a lot of humans interacting with different systems, maybe with, with this analytical data where you get your prices from um, interfaces to uh, they, they are using maybe um, um, interfaces into the web or business software like your ERP, CRM, financial databases, um, and of course, also documents. And humans are very good at, at working with all these kind of interfaces, be it structured like an Excel or a database or unstructured data sources like a document. Now, if you want to replace this process with, with RPA, if you say, uh, if we go back to this slide and you say, okay, hey, an automated lookup on a website, we can do it with a robot. It's always the same task. Go on Google Maps, Google for address, see if you get a match. If you get a match, it's okay. Look in your database. Do you have a customer with the same address or similar address, similar name already installed? If yes, if no, then everything's fine. Check the current price, create and send an offer. As long as there's no errors in here, all these tasks can be done by a robot. Uh, yeah, by a robot. But the problem is the documents. Robots, um, RPA is, is very good at handling structured documents. So if you go look into a business software and usually the, the, the user interface or the data you get back, it always has the same structure. A database always has the same structure. The robot knows how to interpret, interpret this with structured information and goes forward in the process. But with documents, they can come in in, in a lot of different forms. There's different layouts, there's different um, 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 handwriting, there's, there's like a, a lot of information on a document that we as a human can look at and directly understand because we have all the contextual information to understand, ah, this is the vendor. And sometimes it's placed in the right top corner, sometimes it's placed in the left top corner, but the robot is, is unable to, to, he doesn't have the brains to understand documents usually. So what you need to do if you want to use documents inside of your RPA process is to make the unstructured documents into structured data. And, and this is what we at PowerShift are doing. So um, how are we doing it? Um, maybe quick look inside of, of, of PowerShift to actually show how that is looking because um, otherwise maybe it, it gets boring pretty fast. So if we have, for example, a correspondence document here, um, what you want from, from this correspondence, it, it can be maybe a cancellation, it, it could be, um, a request or anything. What you want is something like the sender. You want to know uh, who has sent this document, who is receiving this document, maybe a subject, document date, in what language was this document written, and what kind of contract numbers is. 
And with this information, you could now automatically, by a robot, create um, a response. You, you know what kind of customer sent it. You know which contract he's maybe complaining about. Uh, you maybe understand the subject. Uh, you know the date. You know the language. So together with AX Semantics and RPA, you could maybe automatically create a reply and tell him, hey, yeah, um, reply to a letter. And this is the result of of understanding documents and be able to interpret where the data is and, and structure it in a way. And how we are doing it is we're getting documents from the robot. We are doing stuff like uh, disk queuing, rotation control, checking if a picture is, is good enough to, to make an OCR, uh, read out all the characters on the document, read out all the handwritten stuff, read out barcodes, uh, check the layout, like all this stuff is done at the beginning of a process. Um, then separation. Sometimes you get documents which are not well separated. So you get an invoice, the first two pages, and the next two pages are a delivery note. So you need to understand, OK, the first two pages are this, the other two pages are something different to know what kind of data to extract. So separate the document at the correct um, place. Then again, classification. First two pages invoice, second two pages uh, delivery note. Classify what kind of document is it, and then extract the relevant data for the customer until you have a structured JSON that we can give back and that the robot is able, again, to work with. Because the robot usually is, is very good in handling structured data. So um, no, let's. Yeah, sorry. Uh, how we are doing it is, um, I already said that um, our platform is able to, to handle different kinds of documents, be it invoices, delivery notes, correspondence forms, some individual custom documents that, that only one customer has. And what we are doing in the back, we are not training our AI how to read out an invoice or how to read a delivery note, but we are training our AI how to find a sender on a document, how to find a document date, how to find a document number. And we are not training on this one document, but on all the documents of all of our customers. Because uh, as soon as you work with, with machine learning, with artificial intelligence, what you need is, maybe you heard that in the news, but you need a lot of data in the back, um, annotations, uh, so that the machine gets more intelligent and intelligent over time. And so if you process an invoice with us, and we are able to find the correct sender. It also helps to train the machine on a correspondence to find the correct sender, because the data points are a lot of the times on the documents at the same spot. But yeah. So back to this graphic. Again, robot is very good at working with structured data. And as soon as you use something like our platform, document understanding AI, uh, the robot is also able to very well work with documents. And let's go back to our simple process from the start, which was completely driven by humans. Um, if you use us, you can go and, and completely automate it and get as many um, uh, humans out of uh, this process as possible, and therefore save on time, save on costs, and most importantly, save on errors, because uh, uh, machine learning can be um, used to actually perform a lot better uh, at certain use cases than a human. And to round this up with the form, um, I showed you already the correspondence. But here's an example uh, of an invoice where, yeah, again, sender, receiver is found, um, document date, document number, line items uh, can also be extracted, amounts can be extracted by tax rate. Uh, and here's also an example of a little handwritten form that would fit into our process where someone has to fill out this super complex form. And you would be able to, to extract most important information like first name, last name, also some random notes, and also check if there is a signature present on the document. So uh, this data could be given back in a structured way into our business process to then be processed automatically. Yeah. That's it. That's Quick it. And dirty. <laughs> that's it. That, that's, uh to put some complicated or complex software into uh, five slides and say, that's it, that's nice. So um, thank you for that question. Um, you see the clapping hands coming up here. Um, uh, the question, what's the one or two use cases that your most successful customers are actually doing already with the software that you offer? 
Yeah, so it's the, the classical purchase to pay documents like delivery notes, orders, invoices, credit notes. So that's all the, the same similar type of document that's very popular. Um, uh, the second um, most common is actually just this general correspondence type. So you want to classify and structure all your incoming documents. You want to find some common ground uh, that, that's um, the same for all the documents you get in your post of box. And so you just extract some general data like, again, sender, receiver, subject, and then most of the time, some kind of reference to either a customer number, a contract number, mm -hmm. uh, or some other internal number. And the handwritten forms, sadly, are around a lot. There is a lot <laughs> of handwritten forms we are processing. OK, so the handwritten form are the worst case ones. And, and what's the one use case that you wish your customers would be doing but are not implementing yet? There's not that, that, that one use case. Um, I see a lot of potential in customer self-service. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Revolut. And I like that in the onboarding process, you, you have to make a photo of your, of your passport and they are onboarding you based on this passport. This technology is a little older, but there, there's a lot of similar onboarding processes or self-service processes I wish my, my normal bank would have or my insurance company would have or just the, the um, uh, garage, Werkstatt, the, car car repairing shop around the corner would have where I would be able to upload a document and get feedback in minutes or seconds based on the information inside of this document. And that usually not happens but because every time I upload a document somewhere, a human needs to look at it and it takes ages until I get feedback. And that's the one use case I would love to see our software used more for customer self-service. Okay. Interesting. OK, thank you. You will be around for networking in a few minutes as well, I guess. Um, so uh, let's go and uh, go for cheating to talk uh, with what UiPath actually offers in general. Uh, gladly, gladly. I will share my screen with you guys just for a moment. Uh, it's hopefully this one. Yeah, works. I can see your screen. Perfect. Perfect. So let's move forward here. So as, as Robert also already said, I'm going to talk about the uh, UI path. Um, at first, I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction of what exactly RPA is. Then who is UI path? Uh, some exp examples we actually use in a daily business and with real clients. And also in the last point, I'm going to talk about the AX semantics connector. So, Imagine a software which can use and connect all of your applications out of the box. Imagine the software can be trained in a short period of time to replicate rule-based actions just like a regular human. Add diverse possibilities to the automation like extract text, for example, Parashift, from documents, establish workflows, or generate text like RX Semantics. These are the functions of RPA. So what is RPA or how do you define work processes? So um, in a normal work structure or a normal uh, work process, you would tell there are two types of processes, structured processes, which are like rule-based and repetitive and complex processes, like which demand intuition, experience, creativity, and empathy. As you can see here on the right side, the human takes off a lot of um, structured pro processes uh, which takes off takes a lot of time and energy and it's just something you could easily automate. With an RPA, these processes could be minimized by a lot. The robot could take uh, could take these processes over and make sure that the human has now more time for more important tasks. With RPA, within a company, you can not only increase productivity, you also increase availability increase the quality, and also there's a higher employee satisfaction. Just imagine every day you have to wake up in the morning, go to the office, and do the same tasks over and over again just to like get the regular routine started. All this could be done while, with the robot while you are just getting yourself a coffee. So now to who is UiPath? UiPath is the RPA leader. There are many RPA programs and platforms available, you, but UiPath was, was one of the first and is currently the biggest one. He, they are the leader. They are based in America and uh, are 
really visionaries in their field. They are also um, they offer they offer connectivity with different software which the others can't do on this level. As you can see here, this is uh, the Gartner chart. Uh, it's an independent uh, independent company who evaluates those um, um, softwares. And you can see here, UiPath is quite high up as the leader. And from the visionary, they're also quite to the right side. We ourselves, Ikawa, as Robert already said, we are based in Switzerland, and we are a saver partner with them. So UiPath offers three core functions. First one is the robot. The robot itself is the one who executes the automation. Then Studio. This is for the development of the automation and the orchestrator. In here, you can manage the robot and the automations. In addition, UiPath offers extensions which you can use for custom workflows, document extraction, extraction or service integration. Um, as I said, the robot itself, it's like imita it's an imitation of the human and the robot can use any software just like a human could do. It is it works with a combination of multiple technologies uh, to have either direct access to the application or through visual or textual, textual screen detection. And it's based on a .NET software, so it can be installed on any Windows OS. As you can see here on the right side, these are some of the examples UiPath can natively work with. But as I said, uh, whenever uh, a normal human can use a software or access a software, UI, the UiPath robot can do it as well. Programming or coding with UiPath is quite easy. There, it's a mix between low and high code development. Um, you work in a, you train the robot in a modular principle. So these are like different modules which you, which you can connect together. You can also uh, record workflows similar to the Excel macro recorder. Maybe you've, you've heard of that before. Um, the processes can be visually represented with flowcharts and with nesting. And if necessary or when necessary, Automations can be added with uh, fully integrated C Sharp, Visual Basic, or .NET programming. So you can add pretty much whatever you want to an automation. And then also the last part, the UI management app. Management app. Um, the management app uh, looks over the robot itself and its licenses. Like let's say you have 20 robots in your company and you have to keep track when the license run out. The automations to see how are they running, any any problems, the jobs itself, at what time are automations running, whether any exceptions, is there something that shouldn't be the case or is everything running smoothly, and reusable modules. So you can reuse those modules you used in a previous automation with a new one and etc. As I said, it's also for the performance and problem monitoring. So if let's say from 200 tasks a robot takes over, uh, there's a, a, a mistake quote of 20%, then you can automate it that uh, then auto an email will be sent to, uh, to a stakeholder and they will make sure that, uh, or they will check uh, in on the automation to see what's wrong. And as almost everything in today's age, they also offer a mobile app on iOS and Android. So now to some examples. This here is with a client. Um, I don't know if you can see it that well. I can just explain to you real quick. So we have here a client who has to who has an Excel, and each month they have 100 to 150 lines of the Excel, uh, no, and 100 to 150 Excel files. Sorry, not lines. Excel files, and they have to copy paste those. They have to check the Excel first, upload it in in SAP, and then confirm it. Now the robot takes over the whole process. So the robot itself checks the Excel with the rules uh, which we're giving at the beginning. It uploads it in SAP. It simulates the input, waits for a couple of minutes, up to two hours, depending on the amount of inputs, checks it, and then executes it. And after the execute, execution, there will be another check. This here is uh, the workflow uh, shown like that. Uh, I have to say, I'm sorry, it's in German. Uh, I couldn't change it. So uh, maybe you can see here that uh, the Excels, uh, let me see. I said the Excels will be now going through the robot directly to SAP and then to the final, final business controller versus it's going to be checked each and every step and then taking over and then making sure that there is just a lot of time being saved. 
then now here we have a second one. In this case, we have uh, we um, created a program to split PDFs because a customer wanted to receive a lot of uh, different kinds of PDFs, which are like uh, one PDF contains multiple customers. So we developed a, a program which you can drag and drop in the PDF. You can split it within um, the web browser. And after it's been split, uh, you can assign it to which company it belongs to, and it will automatically then um, the, um, upload it on the DMS. So these are like two things, as I said before. Um, here we are working with a, with a web-based software which we created. The web-based uh, web software takes over the whole splitting part, and in the background, the robot takes this information, takes the metadata, and then uploads it automatically into the DMS server, so the documents are saved there. And then also here an example we have just that last process that splitting actually mm -hmm. uh, the idea was to now also uh, save the ready split up documents and in a later stage we could use these ready split documents to train machine learning to also automate this kind of process um, further so it's just a first step to have to do the manual separation and the data that now comes out of the manual separation could be used later on to automate um, even further like exactly. um, yeah, exactly. No, thank you very much. Um, as Tilo already like mentioned, we also work, uh, closely work with PartnerShift. Here in this example, you can see here um, that uh, the customer receives an email. Uh, the PDF has been extracted with the robot, and then PartnerShift extracts the information from the PDF, the data, um, checks it with SAP, and then either confirms it within the SAP or if there's a if there's a mistake or there's a problem. They will then come back to the stakeholder and then make sure to to communicate said said uh, mistake. And uh, thanks to PowerShift's uh, PowerShift's uh, data extraction, uh, the data can be it can be easily extracted in a way that uh, the robot can read it easily, and the customer can also easily identify it. And now to the last part, the AX Semantics connector. As Robert said, we are working on a connector which is available shortly. The connector is simply just uh, one of the modules which you can easily drag and drop within the uh, UFF Studio. So with this connector, you, whatever, however your process looks, you can, for example, um, take an email, generate a text from it, and then send a new email back with that or something like that. There are many possibilities thanks to this connector. And this connector is either available in the UFF Studio itself directly. You can just go into the search, type it in, um, or you can go to the UFF Marketplace, type in uh, the RX Semantics connector, and download it from there. And then you can use it with your existing UFF Studio and your future automations. That was it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jin, <laughs> for uh, providing us with a way out of the Excel SAP hole. Uh, so uh, hands up for everyone that does data entry jobs once per month at least. So yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for that. So so what's your what's your favorite automation that you have seen at one of your clients? So funny thing is, um, I when I, uh, when I was still studying or I'm still studying, uh, I used to work in a bank, and I was doing ex the exact same thing but manually. So I had a document of customers. I had to uh, look out the name, take the car customer number, put it into the system, recheck it. I had to do all do all of this manually back then. And uh, now we are doing the exact same thing for different bank, but automated. And it just uh, makes me happy to know that somebody isn't just like slaving away the whole day in front of the computer and just doing the same exact thing all the time. Yes, of course, as a student, it was easy money, but also mentally, I was just exhausted from the same information all the time. And uh, it just made me happy, just know like, okay, this can be automated, it's done, and it's that easy versus like, you know, sitting in front of the computer for eight hours doing the same thing. Yeah, so so making the world one, one, one time, one piece better for each other. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I have the question from Richard, uh, how would your iPath replace the Zapier as in AX connectors? So how would it compare from Zapier to your iPath being one better or the other? I think that's what you mean. Well, so Zapier and 
UiPath both have their place in the market. Um, of course, I would say since I'm a UiPath partner, UiPath is much better. Go use UI, UiPath. Um, but I'm also going to be honest that uh, both have their advantages and disadvantages. I'm not that familiar with uh, how good CPR is. I just know that UiPath is quite strong in the market. They have a lot of big backing from bigger companies. And um, also they have regular updates bigger updates, which, which increase their possibilities, increase their automation workflows. And with smaller companies like us, uh, we can add to that with the, for example, with connectors, with AX semantics. Yeah. Well, what, what I think is um, that there's like two points. One, Sapier can get expensive pretty fast if you have a lot of volume. So um, maybe at some point, your iPath can actually be cheaper than Sapier to use, depending on the volume. The second is that Sapier normally gives you only very specific zaps. So in Sapier, you're, you're dependent that you have the, the right object to create inside of um, Acceptor or AX. And if you, since Acceptor is a, is a very highly configurable system and you have a very special module in place in there, uh, Sapier most likely won't have a connector to this very special module and you, it, it, it would stop maybe and you couldn't use Sapier anymore. And there you have a flexibility with your iPath to actually also connect anything inside of AX that has a user interface. You are with your iPath, you can connect to it. And that's like uh, another thing that, that's that's a lot better with your iPath. Well, yeah. again, it depends on the situation. Yeah, one, one thing that we've seen is, uh, and that's, I mean, Zapier is, is super good for connecting cloud services, but you have some part of the automation that runs on a local computer. Like I have to click A, B, Z, or, or like a Selenium stuff on it. There, where, there's, uh, I think, Jitin, you mentioned the screen recorder feature or Excel recording feature, something like that can be for like local automation. I mean, that's where your iPad was coming from replacing people that do manual tasks. So that's something where, where I would actually look at your iPad as well. Yeah, right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but but Zapier is not able to to execute any DLL libraries. Uh, for instance, if you want to move your mouse in your desktop and stuff like that, right? Uh, so yeah. so just what you mentioned, the imitating the the human processes that you have, uh, Zapier is not able to do that. And which is one of the reasons, by, uh, by the way, why we are not using Zapier at our company at Feather. Um, just to, just to back you up a little bit, Jitin, uh, we're using your iPath as well <laughs> for two use cases. Not for the one that I'm going to present uh, later on, but um, uh, when it comes to RPA, I think your iPath, Automation Anywhere, stuff like that, it's uh, always a better choice if you want to automate um, manual tasks on the desktop. Yeah, also, uh, Zapier doesn't offer high highest level of data protection so I'm, I'm not saying that they lose data but you you send it to a cloud service and they have tracing and debugging and so there's always be some some data left in their services i mean that's what the ui is for but if you have some personal health information and stuff like that you probably would want to run it in a more controlled environment and that that's something that sapia doesn't offer because that's not their business model and the ui5 is actually better Okay, thank you, Jitin. You'll be around mm -hmm. I hope, uh, in a few minutes as well. And we have the last for today uh, with Jan. So uh, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll be referring quite a bit to Tilo and Jitin as well because, uh, I mean, they have covered very interesting um, topics already and uh, I don't want to repeat them uh, one by one. I think you should see my screen by now. Yes, works well. All right, perfect. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, one very specific use case that we have implemented at Feather, um, where we actually used AX Semantics not as um, a, a whole software or how you want to see it, but uh, rather as a microservice. So AX Semantics in our IT landscape, IT architecture is, is just, just a tiny piece uh, that fulfills the text generation part. But um, something very important that comes with automating processes that we've already seen, especially on, on Tilo slides, is that there are a lot of processes around the, the pure automation around the robot, uh, such as data pre-processing, right? Analyzing documents, getting the, the right information out of these documents to get them into a structured format, um, which means that even our use case will show a few components where we do have to put in um, work in terms of uh, software engineering to get um, these structured data first to, to filter down our big masses of data so that we can um, actually use it in X. Otherwise, it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be possible. And um, yeah, coming from that, uh, first of all, I'd like to 
give you at least a little bit of context about uh, who is speaking in front of you right now, um, uh, since it will be relevant for later. Uh, as you can see right here, there are two persons on this picture. Uh, my colleague, Thomas Schertler, and I, we form the data science team at Feather Pharma. And um, so this is what I'm doing right now. And my background is based in software engineering, classical IT. And I've been um, doing uh, some IT consulting as well in the area of uh, SAP Hybris, uh, whereas my main focus is not based in the SAP area, but rather on uh, robotics, AI, natural language processing. Uh, so working with uh, text data, working with speech data, stuff like that. And uh, what we're doing in house is um, pretty pretty mixed up. Uh, my my background combining software engineering and IT consulting is uh, actually um, well. My current job consists both of um, both of my mixed background, um, where we do in house consulting within our company. So we're a two man show where we talk to our in house in house customers. We're sort of service providers in-house and we go to our in-house departments such as controlling and finance um microbiology department the, the production departments um just just to name a few examples and we do in-house consultings we uh, do ideation workshops to see if there are any automation potentials and then after that we define the requirements to fulfill um to, to solve these problems. Uh, for instance, if there's a lot of manual work, for instance, if someone needs some um, assistance in, in um, making decisions based on data, we, is, we assist in that. And uh, usually the solution is in some sort of some, some form of system. Uh, it is basically, basically an IT solution that comes out of that. We define the requirements and we also implement the whole solution architecture and do the software development part as well. So it's like the, the whole, whole data science chain coming from getting the project, um, getting the data, transforming the data and implementing software, and then even fitting this into the software architecture. This is what we are doing. This is what I'm doing right now. And um, coming from that, understanding that it will be more clear um, how we got to the, to the use case that I'm going to present. As you can see on this slide here, uh, I think this is this is a common problem that occurs in, in especially fast growing companies. Um, just to give you a few numbers, Feather is increasing their employee count by se uh, by seventy employees each month. I think uh, a few months ago we hit five thousand employees, and we are steadily increasing by seventy per month um, in average. Which means we do have a lot of paperwork, um, such as contracts. Uh, when it comes to hiring and customers, we have quality inspection paperwork. We have logistics. We have uh, lots of uh, documentation. For example, in audit trails as well. Um, audit to cash process has a lot of paperwork, and um, even so, if we have parts of parts of that pap uh, paperwork automated or digitalized. Um, still a lot of emails, invoices, Excel sheets going around, flying around. Um, we do have operating procedures in pharma, a lot of log files. We have product descriptions. Um, we have a lot of uh, communication between customers that is, uh, that is um, in, in uh, emails. And lots of these documents, they very often follow the same patterns. And um, if they follow the same patterns, uh, I think uh, Jitin mentioned it, Robotic process automation is very good for rule-based and uh, repetitive tasks, right? So we have um, looked at some of these repetitive tasks. We have a great connection to our colleagues from the controlling and finance department. I think it's very classical that uh, data science is uh, closely coupled to controlling and finance. And we went into several ideation workshops. Uh, the idea was to see if we can further automate um, different types of reports. Since our colleagues are pretty uh, affine when it comes to automation, they already have a lot of uh, reports automated or even just parts of it. They're using a lot of Excel sheets so they can use macros to automate um, the generation of tables, um, generating analyses, um, figures, stuff like that. But the one thing that they are not able to automate nowadays is written text, which is uh, which usually accompanies um, the reports because our management uh, likes to have um, some sort of text that accompanies the data tables, um, just to just to give more context. And uh, we've looked at several financial report types, balance sheets, income statements, and so on as well as um, the topics planning and forecasting. For instance, we do forecasting on our available uh, FTE, our company expenses, provisions, and a lot more than that. And there have been quite a few reports that were um, 
very suitable for a quick win. So a piece of advice here as well, if you want to start with text automation, try to look for an easy use case, try to look for a quick win um, that has a big amount of manual labor, that has um, a big frequency, like uh, it's a, that is very repetitive and has a uh, small complexity in automating, uh, meaning that the rules that lie behind the text generation shouldn't be too complicated. And based on... Uh, based on these three criteria, we found that uh, profit and loss statements, uh, as well as our reports on company expenses, were very suitable um, to to get a quick win to get a first pilot project. So, just to give you a few visuals uh, right here, uh, this is this is just an exemplary illustration where you can see on the uh, on the top left. Uh, this is an extraction of our Excel report where you can just see uh, some some uh, highlights uh, where the, the costs, um, where, where the company expenses have been higher or lower than actually expected and actually planned. And there's uh, this text on the, the right, the fat text, which contains uh, multiple paragraphs um, that uh, basically just, just gives context why those costs or expenses have been higher or lower than uh, initially planned. And this text on the right is manually writ uh, written and is pretty long. I think it's around uh, one one uh, dinner, fear, uh, dinner four page um, for each cost department, for each uh, management level. Um, right here, we are looking at SVP reports. I think we have around 10 SVPs, um, which means there are 10 reports generated per month, but we also have different uh, management levels that we will be including in the next months as well. And um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of paperwork. So um, the question is, what have we done? The, the process nowadays, or a few months ago, was the business controller logs into SAP, um, gets his data tables that he wants to look at, and then he manually extracts those numbers, which are sometimes uh, seven, eight, or even nine digits long, and um, manually types those numbers into his Excel report, into his uh, Excel text, right? And uh, as Tilo already covered, 2% of, of copying from documents is usually wrong. And especially when we're talking about um, twisting digits, uh, this might have occurred in the, in the past. We don't have any evidence, but it's pretty sure it, it, it truly has happened. Um, I mean, uh, this time um, it, it is not a Xerox printer that twists the digits, but it's, it's a human. And it's quite common that this happens in our company as well. And our idea was, okay, if the human copies the, the data from a system and has uh, some sort of logic to automate the text, um, a robot or at least a, a system, a software should be able to do the same. What we have done is, um, luckily, uh, we have a data management system or multiple data management systems from where we retrieve the data. Um, the advantage here compared to Excel sheets is that uh, those systems, they run on servers. So on these servers, we can have jobs that run on a daily basis. We ha can have uh, connectors that enables us to pull the data out of the systems instead of uh, having a robot um, opening an Excel file and going into the Excel files and doing stuff uh, here and there. And meaning that uh, we have also looked at the option of using RPA at this point, but we decided not to use RPA because we had uh, connectors available. We draw those data out into a file server running on, on a, a local um, Ubuntu machine, apply our data processing um, written in Python onto the data because it's uh, we, we have huge data tables, whereas we only need, um, I think, uh, around 50 data values, uh, 50 data fields for the, for the actual text report at the end. We just filter down um, the whole data. Um, push it to AX Semantics, uh, where we also implemented the text generation, of course, AX Semantics gives us the text back, as you can see here on the right. Um, and this text is um, being automatically sent to the controlling business partner afterwards. Meaning that this whole pipeline that you're seeing right here is fully automated. There's a cron job. Uh, this is just a Linux term, uh, meaning that there is a job that runs uh, every X or Y hours, or in our case, uh, this job runs monthly. And uh, each month, uh, I think on the fifth working day, this management report is automatically forwarded to our colleagues. In addition to that, uh, we have an automated testing pipeline on, on top of that, just to see if the code is working correctly with the data that is, uh, that is changing each day and each month, right? So uh, we are also ensuring that our code, our software is still working 
on uh, different data as well. Um, yeah, coming from that, uh, what we've done uh, is we mirrored our um, IT architecture. We have uh, we have um, two two running systems. We have a dev and test system where we test new features, where we implement new code, and uh, as soon as we change the code, we have the test pipeline that you can see right here. If the test pipeline runs through and there's a green tick, meaning that every test was successful, um, the code is pushed to our production uh, system, uh, meaning that the um, the changes are included in our monthly reports. What um, uh, you can see right here are our initial estimations. Um, we were estimating that the time savings would be around 600 hours per year. It was uh, rather pessimistic. I think we are hitting around 800 hours per year um, by now, um, by, by looking at the past months. And what is very important and something that uh, Tilo also showed in his slides is that we have uh, more consistency. We have less errors because we're automating the process. Uh, the delivery is faster. We save time. And um, most importantly for this use case for us as a company is that we are able to use the same infrastructure or the, the IT architecture that we used here, and we can adapt it, we can scale it, and we can reuse big parts of it for other use cases. We can automate other reports, we can um, look at different sections in our company besides uh, controlling a finance. We could uh, even look at cl uh, clinical trial reports, for instance. Um, I think there's been a use case um, that is uh, showcased on the AX um, homepage. We're also looking at cl clinical trials uh, right now. We can uh, use AX for that. And this is probably the, the most important part for us, the scalability and reusability of, um, of um, the, the uh, couple technologies that we have put together in our automated, uh, automated pipeline. Exactly. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for sharing that and also for the nice presentation. So uh, Tilo actually put a question in the chat and it's fairly similar to what I had in mind is, so did the people that read that, especially in the management, were aware that they were reading automatic reports and did their perception of the content change? It's very interesting. So, so the first question is, does the management even read the reports? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and, and, and coming from that, I can answer you that, um, management does not always read those reports, meaning that uh, it is it does make sense to automate reports because uh, they are not always read, right? <laughs> if, if, no, if nobody reads them, but, <laughs> if, if nobody reads the reports, but they are still required, then just automate them, right? Um, then, uh, then again, we had um, a few discussions with our customers in the house and um, the feedback was, was rather mixed, right? Um, we were discussing, do we want to add a, a small annotation that says generated by AI below the report? And we, we decided not to do that because we wanted to see, does the management realize that those reports are AI written, AI generated? And uh, actually in the first month, the feedback was kind of mixed. It was like 50-50, I think 50% of the management, they realized uh, this was um, not uh, handwritten because every report was, was following the same logic and uh, everyone has their own kind of creative style to write their reports, right? So, so this, this part did the own style, uh, was removed from those reports and replaced by the basic logic that we implemented. And, um, then there were other business controllers. They were already quite thorough. They followed, um, they followed the logic, um, and uh, had a, had a great structure already. And, uh, for these departments, uh, there was no, no big difference. There was, uh, no comment, uh, from the management regarding the, the, um, reports and then after our pilot phase we, we already communicated that those reports are AI generated right now. And, and my question was actually how was the reception on the people that actually would have written that reports manually? I mean I guess that would have been in your in your share, share stakeholder team but what was their reception on the introduction of that feature? Oh, it uh, was very positive. Uh, I mean it's um, saving them a lot of time uh, as, as I think it was uh, Tilo Ajitin, uh, who said that uh, you could just automate the process and grab a coffee in the meantime, right? And uh, this is exactly what they're doing. They are grabbing a coffee. They are thinking, uh, they are thinking about how can I give more context, uh, to my report? Because I don't want to just, just, um, mirror what is, what the data is saying. I want to give more context. I don't want to say that, um, we have, uh, we have paid, uh, 50% more money for, um, laboratory, um, material 
but instead I want to comment why did we pay 50% more, right? And this gives them more time for doing that while they're still saving um, a lot of their total time in writing those uh, those reports. Um, reception has been very positive. Uh, we're still cooperating with them and they want to scale up and um, extend those uh, the, the automation to VP reports and um, team leader reports as well. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it actually allows them to concentrate and focus on their actual work instead of just fulfilling report requirements that would yeah. have probably not written. They, they don't actually like writing or copying the data. So <laughs> <laughs> we got rid of uh, we got rid of an annoying, rather annoying part of uh, of the generation process. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you all. And I think we'll switch to the networking space uh, and uh, we'll see you at the uh, virtual army tables in a few seconds. So, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time.